I hope you will allow me to be just a little self-reflective to begin this episode. It's going somewhere relevant, I promise. But in the last few months of 2018, while I was working as an intern for the Documentation Centre of Cambodia, the accommodation I had organised was in a southern suburb of Phnom Penh, about two and a half miles from the Independence Monument, Bong Trabai. Well, that was how the helpful taxi driver at the airport pronounced it, after being puzzled for a few minutes at my attempts of reading it in English from Google Maps. Boeing, Trebek. In any case, we got there in the end, and like all of my visits to Cambodia, long or short, over the last ten years or so, well, I'm yet to shake this feeling I have when I walk or drive around in the cities or towns, or in the middle of nowhere, that there is this history that I am, you know, not treading on, not in a bad way, but well, it's a little hard to put this feeling into words, but in some sense, everywhere I go, I feel like some part of the history of this country had the potential to occur, right there, or on that bit of land. You may have felt this yourself, well, in any number of places, really. A tour through a historic building, an ancient monument, an old battlefield. Anywhere where you get that sense of, oh yeah, this is where it happened. Cambodia, for me at least, presents this feeling so readily because of my own engagement in the country's past, the relatively recent nature of the history I've spent many years being fascinated by, as well as the sheer sort of, well, the length and breadth of those events. Yes, there are certain landmarks, even tourist destinations, which fully present themselves as historical locations. Many of them have large monuments that act as focal points, in memoriam to remember the past. And in Cambodia's case, the victims of that past. Some of these, as many of you listening will no doubt be aware, are clearly marked on the map. Tulsleng, Chong Ek. Others are less well known and might surprise you to find out they're hiding in plain sight. It was on that same trip in 2018, whilst doing some field work in Prey Veng, one of the provinces toward the border with Vietnam, and one of the areas in which many of the so-called East Zone massacres perpetrated by the Khmer Rouge took place. We were attending a couple of high schools in the area in order to do some surveys of different groups regarding a new office that DC Cam was opening in the region. Anyway, it was getting kind of late in the afternoon, and we pulled into this school's car park, and my Cambodian colleague and I waited for our manager to go and speak with a few people. As we waited again in this fairly nondescript location, just a regular-looking Cambodian high school. Same kind of structure and format to many others, probably built in the 50s or 60s. Chai, the guy I was waiting with who was also working on a mapping project, pointed out an area behind one of the long rectangular buildings with fading yellow paint and said, hey, by the way, there is a mass grave there. My eyes widened. I had no idea. I walked behind the building, there was grass, some trees, to the left a field and an area that the kids played soccer in. Nothing that would indicate what was lying beneath. It turns out that many schools in the region had been used by the Khmer Rouge to temporarily imprison those that had become potential enemies of the party. Many who were actually Khmer Rouge themselves, but thought to be tainted by forces hostile to the party centre tens of thousands of whom came to violent ends at the hands of their own comrades in these purges, the so-called Eastern Zone Massacres. I took a couple of photos and walked back to Che before listening to a talk and conducting a few surveys with some of the students and teachers. It was an experience that served to reinforce the feeling, the presumption that I had always had when I visited the country, that the history was everywhere that any far-off rice field could have been a work site, that any street in Phnom Penh could have been where hundreds, if not thousands, of people had to slowly march out of the city on, where a well could be a grave, and any school could have been a prison. I guess all of these things spring from the fact that the country itself was turned into one massive work site, the prison with no walls, as many survivors remembered it as. Naturally, this is just my somewhat naive, very much an outsider-looking-in kind of perspective. I'm sure that the people that actually lived through this history, or are directly related to those who did, have an altogether different feeling about these spaces. 
feelings like returning to a place of trauma. Not to mention the life-threatening nature of some areas themselves, considering the amount of unexploded ordnance that was littered throughout their environment, and still turns up today. But in any case, the point I'm trying to get to in order to start this episode is that after living in Bong Trabai for a few months, I began noticing the suburb coming up here and there in my studies as well. Like when you learn an actor's name and all of a sudden begin to recognise them everywhere. In this case, the area around the place I was temporarily calling home had been the site of an assassination, the location of certain democratic Kampuchea ministries. It was not all that far from S21, and indeed the house that Doik lived in during his time as commandant of that infamous prison. I would often find myself walking not a few streets back from it on my way to work, a place of such misery. And those are the morbid extremes of that history, and yes, I am drawn to those as much as someone fascinated in that kind of history may be. But I'm always mindful to be in recognition of that suffering, the in memoriam that goes along with considering what happened to this country's people, and not thinking of it as just some charnel house of horrors that the spaces are often characterised as. But it is not just the ghosts of victims imprinted into the stony paths, classroom tiles, or some patch of dirt unknown to all but those who died there and those that murdered them. It was in my research for this episode sifting through the footnotes of David Chandler's Brother Number 1, that I once again noticed Bong Trabai pop up. This time, as the location for a number of secret meetings, seminars really, that were conducted by the newly rebranded Workers' Party of Kampuchea, the name the Cambodian communists had given their movement at the clandestine Party Congress that took place at a railway station in Phnom Penh in 1960. That first official party congress was a defining moment in the history of the party for a number of reasons, some of which will become clearer over the course of this episode. But generally speaking, it was symbolic of the Cambodian communist movement finding its footing and taking its own baby steps toward an independent and self-reliant operation, all part of an underground effort to eventually take power. Until this meeting, Many of the still relatively small amount of Cambodians who considered themselves as part of this operation would have thought themselves part of a communist party, but may have struggled to define exactly what party they belonged to. As we said, their self referential use of the Khmer phrase Ankalo, or the revolutionary organization, reflected this vagueness, even weakness of their position following failed attempts of the public-facing official political party, the so-called Pratya Chan, to compete out in the open with Prince Sihanouk's all-powerful Sankum party. And for the hidden communists, well, they also lacked the ability, and I dare say permission, to wage an armed revolutionary struggle against the government like their comrades in South Vietnam, the National Liberation Front. The predominantly urban-based members of the Workers' Party of Kampuchea could neither stick nor twist. However, many of those in high-ranking positions of the party found that via teaching positions in so-called progressive schools, they had begun to find an audience receptive to their message, carefully vetting potential new members in fear of being infiltrated by informants who could expose the underground network of revolutionaries to Sihanouk's brutal repression. One by one, their numbers began to grow. The message was being spread, and soon it wasn't only students, but also monks, military men, and bureaucrats who could find value in attending these kinds of semi-clandestine seminars on civic virtue, justice, and corruption in Cambodian society. A monk of ten years named Sok Chuan vividly remembered the experience he had at one of these secret seminars, when he was interviewed nearly 30 years later by David Chandler. His recollections from this seminar in Bong Trabai, perhaps in a location that had not been too far from my own accommodations, almost 60 years after it had taken place, revealed to us how the Kampuchean Workers' Party had begun to find a potential base and modus operandi, and how its leaders had been able to formulate a message that would appeal to those that thought change needed to happen in their country. And it didn't rely on simply reciting Marxist or Maoist rhetoric. It fit in with the vernacular of Cambodia, 
with Cambodian cultural paradigm. The case had to be made quite differently than it did for those in, say, South Vietnam, for whom it could be very easily pointed out that their leadership was deeply engulfed in the so-called imperialism of the United States, that the prospect of peace and Vietnamese unity was being prevented by what could easily be characterised as the successes of the colonial French. Cambodia, on the other hand, had escaped any partitions at Geneva. It was nominally independent. Its leader was beloved by most, the former king who could claim that it was he who had gained independence. And if you were coming at it from a politically persuasive angle, well, he was, at this time, certainly more left-leaning than right. It was hard to score points on him. But the message the Cambodian communists began spreading was getting across, particularly with young people, for whom there was perhaps a growing impatience with the somewhat despotic rule of Sihanouk and the strings of corruption which entangled much of the societal strata they were trying to live in. There is a saying that I presume many of you listening would be familiar with in the West. This idea that your progress through life might be harder because it's not what you know, but who you know. Implying that, you know, it might not really be enough to just work hard unless you know the right people. You might not get that far. Well, we could potentially relate that to some of those who had felt disaffected in early 1960s Phnom Penh. Because it wasn't just a case of what you know, or who you know, but also how much you can pay to get anywhere. People that were less likely to interact in that kind of system, be it because of their social standing, their lack of money to pay people in the first place, or because of moral objections, well, these would make ideal recruits. The seminar that Sok Chuan had been invited to attend took place in late 1962, two years after the fledgling Cambodian Communist Party had established itself in the sweaty confines of the Phnom Penh railway station. And the fact that the building itself had friendly policemen and other agents, mostly students, who were acting as guards for the event, shows us that, by now, the movement had begun attracting a more considerable following. It was an audience of 30 or so people, made up predominantly of teachers and students, and the highlight was a speech that was remembered by Chuan for its harmony and persuasiveness, and delivered by someone who was, quote, easy to like. Standing in front of this, well, 30 people's a small crowd, isn't it? In front of them in a neat, white, short-sleeved shirt, with a smooth and handsome face, accompanied by a similarly pleasant way of speaking, was the new leader of the Kampuchean Workers' Party. Salot Sa, although he had been using his revolutionary pseudonym Pol for a few years now. His reputation amongst those watching him talk had been whispered around. He didn't tell the crowd his name, but they already knew who he was. He asked those in attendance to think about Khmer society as it was, pointing out how the government charges Cambodians fees when they're born, when they're married, when they die. No one can do anything unless the government gets its fee. The people gathered, many of whom were very familiar with Buddhist teachings as well as the functions of that community, were reminded that even monks demanded money for their books of sermons. Paul added a rhetorical flourish. Did the Buddha sell anything? His deep voice and calm gestures, something that the students at the school that he taught at were very familiar with, in fact some of his students now stood guard at the front of the building the seminar was taking place in, this manner that attracted them to the movement was also used to relay the deeper truth he was trying to illustrate, that the Cambodian government was rotten, and leading the people into deeper poverty. Paul spoke of a new society, where fees would not be paid to those in power, where everyone would be working, perhaps foreshadowing a country where money had been removed from circulation altogether, as David Chandler suggests in his biography of the man. In one of the more ironic parts of Paul's political seminar, he uses the example of palace dancers, these useless hangers-on, that were living off of the people, failing to mention his own intimate experience in that very same setting, when he himself had been living in a comfortable place, getting an education, being housed by those who worked at the palace. But the audience weren't to know those personal biographical details of the heroic man speaking for such a noble cause. He was the face of change, he didn't speak about the proletariat or dialectic materialism, or Lenin, certainly not Ho Chi Minh. 
He didn't even ask those present to join the Campuchian Workers' Party that he had assumed leadership of. This was just about raising people's consciousness, presenting an ideal, someone eloquent and committed to justice. And he wasn't the only high-ranking member of the party to be doing so, gradually ingratiating themselves to the groups of Cambodian society that would make ideal recruits. Recruits that, when the time was right, would join a violent revolution. Many based on their experiences around these kinds of gentle teachers. A revolution that would soon attract its followers, or perhaps necessitate its followers, to walk out on society and into the jungle, which is where Pol will soon be. Back in the jungle on the border with Vietnam, for fear that Sihanouk's repression of domestic communism would soon claim his life. This was in late 1962, a year that David Chandler says is the last where his sources could provide him information on the double life, the two faces of Salat Tsar. Once he returns to the jungle, he will become a full-time revolutionary, a full-time militant, where the crumbs of evidence that historians have to work with when trying to figure out Pol Pot's personality are absorbed by the Cambodian communist movement itself. The man, brother number one, will become less accessible, but the ideology that he sets upon formulating will soon be unleashed across the whole country. Okay, welcome back everyone to In the Shadows of Utopia podcast. Before we get into the rest of the episode, I want to extend another huge thank you to those who are supporting the show via Patreon, or to anyone who has given a once-off donation via PayPal. You have no idea how much that helps. I also want to thank anyone who has left a review or rating wherever you can, as again, I believe it's quite important for algorithms and things like that. There's a link in the description for anyone who would like to help out in any way they might want to. I really wanted this episode to cover until the end of 1963, as so much important stuff happens in Cambodia that year, but also across Southeast Asia and the rest of the planet in terms of Cold War goings on. It ended up just being way, way, way too much, and I think 1963 in and of itself will have to be two pretty big episodes. So we're going to just focus on Cambodia and a couple of sort of precursor things that are really interesting that would lead us into that fateful year. I also felt that, well, with the very long China episode as a kind of detour last time out, I wanted to tie up some of the loose ends that were left at the end of the last episode we had done on Cambodia proper. But to start us off, let's revisit Cambodia in the early 1960s, particularly the goings-on of the Kampuchean Workers' Party. As you might have noticed that we have Salot Sa as the leader of the Cambodian communists, rather than Tu Samut, uh, one of the old crew from the Khmer Viet Minh era. So to explain that, and to touch base with some of the other more, let's say, prominent Khmer Rouge who will be playing a big role as the series continues, we will begin properly back in Phnom Penh, and in what is increasingly becoming Sihanouk's Cambodia. I want a few markers, a few noticeable bits of scenery in the kind of audio backdrop of at least the first half of this episode. I've dropped a few in so far, but they do warrant repeating if you have anything like the attention span that I do. We're kicking off in 1960, the same year that Sihanouk's father, the king, had died. This was, of course, after Sihanouk himself had abdicated the throne spectacularly, gone into politics but still with the aura of someone who was, until very recently, the king. He'd set up a kind of one-party state thing, where he himself 
was pretty much in the driving seat. Once his father had died, there were a few months of palace intrigue because Sihanouk had to make sure that there wasn't going to be a new king on the throne with any ambitions of rivaling his own power. So eventually, he puts his mum in this kind of guardian of the throne position, something more ceremonial than genuinely powerful. And to tie things up nicely, he also gets a constitutional amendment pushed through that makes him head of state for life. We could go into a bit of detail, it's available in places like Milton Osborne's biography of the prince, but what I think this amounts to is again the kind of two-sidedness of Sihanouk. He's a shrewd royal, looking out for his own position of power, and he's willing to sort of... The analogy that came to mind was someone pulling up the ladder after they have ascended it. Sihanouk is making changes that really make it so no one else can challenge him. No up-and-coming prince of the, you know, hundred or so that were out there can come in and become another focus of power. But there is the other side as well, where we have to remember that, you know, selfish and grandiose as he is, he also genuinely thinks, knows, that there are powerful groups out there trying to subvert his government, the CIA included, as we saw a couple of episodes back. And for someone that thinks he is the person kind of keeping Cambodia together, it makes sense in his eyes to do whatever possible to ensure that. The way he does it is also stuff we've seen before. Propose a referendum on an issue, use dodgy ballots, general intimidation, that thing with a voting slip for him has a photo of him on it, so it's always a bad look to throw that one in the bin. No prizes for guessing, he gets 99.8% of the vote. So, just to iron that out slightly for you, my dear listener, basically it just means that Sihanouk has gone above and beyond the normal realms of power in Cambodia. It's like one of those anime where a character fuses with another to make a super powerful new thing with the combined powers of both, where Sihanouk was the most popular king and has now sort of fused with the most powerful political position as well, and made sure there wasn't going to be another king anytime soon. So this amendment in 1960 really can't be forgotten. It's Sihanouk putting in writing that he is in charge and Cambodia is his. It also, you know, obviously the 99.8% vote thing is, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but the thing to take away is that he definitely does command a huge amount of popularity, something to keep in mind as his attempts to stay in power over the next decade or so will result in rather serious collateral damage. Sihanouk will be one of those big headline acts in the Festival of Destruction that is coming to Cambodia, along with, you know, the Cold War, the native communist movement, and of course, the other big macro thing to keep in mind, the resumption of armed struggle by the NLF. That is, the Vietnamese communists in South Vietnam, what we can basically just call the beginning of the Vietnam War. So just keep in mind the difference there in these communist committee decisions between these branches across Southeast Asia. Those in South Vietnam are basically saying we have nothing else to do but literally take up arms and start a violent struggle. And the National Liberation Front is the organization that will take up that endeavor. The so-called Viet Cong. Compare that to the Cambodian communists who are saying, well, okay, political struggle, meaning competing for victory via politics, well, that's not going to work. But there is no way we could start a violent struggle either, but we will explore the bulk of that huge topic in the next couple of episodes. Finally, the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that meeting at the railway station that also occurs in 1960, the Party Congress of the Cambodian Communists. We went into detail a couple of episodes ago about what happened there and the significance of that Congress, as well as alluding to it again at the start of this episode, but in a nutshell. It is the creation of a more autonomous Cambodian communist movement looking to shed the influence of the Vietnamese as well as the influence of the old guard that were part of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. It is this meeting where we see the returning Cambodians who had studied in Paris and become communists starting to find a real footing, as well as the early signs of the party deciding on its ideological direction. It's like a band getting rid of their lead singer or something and trying to find their sound. Now, how this band is going to start lining up, who is going to start having input about songwriting, who is on rhythm guitar, etc., as well as their target audience, all of that 
has some really important developments in this time period, basically from 1960 to 1963. Sihanouk's almost bipolar relationship with the left, either abroad or domestically, is also going to be another theme here, and a good way of showing us this dynamic is a discussion of another of the Cambodian communists who will become quite prominent in the rest of the series. That would be Q Sampan. You might remember him from quite a few episodes back when we talked about a much younger Salot Tsa going on a kind of summer holiday to the temples of Angkor. This was during the latter stages of the Second World War. Sa had gone on this trip with a few students, one of whom, the son of a regional judge, was a young man by the name of Q Sampan. Their paths diverged for a number of years afterwards, but reconvened in Paris, as Sampan also became one of the Cambodian students to study there, and he also found the Marxist calling. Sampan had taken over as leader of the Marxist Circle, the committed group of Parisian-based communist students after Yang Sari had returned to Cambodia in the late 1950s. When Sampan himself finished his doctorate and returned to Phnom Penh, he, like the others in this circle, made the choice between a relatively easier life as a fancy, well-educated, high-society type that was on offer to someone of his ilk, to the far less comfortable position of underground communist and above-ground progressive person. Instead of coming back and getting into business or something, or becoming a Sankum party official, he invests his savings in starting a small bi-weekly French-language newsletter called Le Observateur. Philip Short writes that, quote, His assignment from the underground Phnom Penh City Communist Committee was to rally intellectual support and reach out to potential communist sympathisers in mainstream political life. It was a role to which Sampan was well suited. He was an idealist, in whom personal morality and social conscience were intrinsically linked. To help make ends meet, he taught maths at a private school on weekends. End quote. Short goes on to describe Sampan along the lines that his students remembered him from this time. Someone punctual, who wanted things done on time, but wasn't the kind of teacher that punished them. Someone who set an example along the lines of his idealism. A small, simple living space, wearing sandals instead of shoes. Someone that would allude to his politics and his dislike of the corruption in the capital through little metaphors. Something he specialised in for his newsletter as well. Short uses a story that Sampan's younger brother told him to highlight some of the more, well, the rigidity of someone who was this idealistic. Having invited his brother out to dinner, he told him to order anything he wanted. Sampan's younger brother orders the duck. Then, afterwards, he asks him, how was your meal? Was it good? The brother replies, yes, it was. To which Sampan levels a finger at him and kind of chews him out of the table. You ought to be ashamed, sitting here eating such good food when most people who work ten times harder than you have nothing at all. Short characterises this as Sampan having, quote, a nimble, even mischievous mind, a ready pen and a dry sense of humour. But there was also something blinkered about him, an austere side to his character, which treated life as though it should be lived along geometrical lines of discipline and self-denial. End quote. Sampan is really interesting because he will, in large part, become kind of a face of the communist movement for years. Even now, as the last living member of the former Khmer Rouge leadership that went on trial, he endures as this symbol of the revolution. He is the one who I've probably heard speak the most in various documentaries or during the sessions of the Khmer Rouge tribunals. And you do get this sense of a true believer who has the ability to compartmentalise things in a way that absolves himself from blame while still clinging to some version of reality where the ideal was good, the intent was noble, the plan was good, but that others ruined what they had tried to do. He goes fairly close to the line of apology, but never quite crosses it. He acknowledges mistakes, but will blame others for committing them, and claiming he had no real power. But I guess that will be an episode far down the track. Anyway, there are a few reasons that we would want to have Sampan remain a kind of relevant figure in this story. Some obvious because, well, he'll form part of that leadership of democratic Campuchia, but also because he is symbolic of that educated core that will do so. 
His 1959 thesis was the first systematic application of Marxist economic theory to specific problems in Cambodia. He lends a kind of legitimacy to the movement for those that wanted to be friendly toward it. And let's not pretend that there weren't many, particularly in the early days, that oriented themselves on the side of the plucky underdogs that the Cambodian communists were seen as. For instance, the introduction he gets in a write-up about his thesis from some university in England in 1976 basically paints him as a kind of national hero. I believe the academic in question went on to be seen as kind of an apologist for the regime, though. But it's interesting that, well, due to the extreme secrecy of the so-called real leadership, some will even presume that Sampan was the leader of the movement for a couple of years because of his public profile. And in 1960 the particular period of Cambodian history that we are kicking this episode off in, well, he is also symbolic of Sihanouk's alternate repression and courting of the left. Early that year, Sihanouk will single out Sampan for praise, for treating his regime with fairness. As I was saying before, Sampan has this newspaper that he kind of self-publishes, and he's extremely careful not to say anything outright critical of Sihanouk's regime. But at the same time, it's clear what he isn't saying as well. This kind of subtle sedition eventually gets him into trouble, however, when just a few months after being praised by the former king, one day Sampan finds himself surrounded by a dozen or so thugs who proceed to strip him naked in the street and administer a government-sanctioned physical assault. When the discussion of a local magazine editor being beaten and left naked in the street by a group of state-sponsored thugs comes up in Parliament, the minister directly responsible said something to the effect of, well, it's not the job of the police to protect opponents of the regime. And that says a lot about the state of repression that anyone who dared to question the actions of the Sankung government were subject to, and puts us in a bit of a weird position where we might consider someone like Q Sampan, at this particular time that is, of pursuing a rather brave commitment. Sihanouk himself will denounce the left generally, saying they were trying to sow hatred of the monarchy, etc., and Sampan's paper is shut down, as well as a few other ones, and about 50 or so prominent leftists are taken into questioning by the police, and perhaps a third of those, including Sampan, were put in jail for a month. No charges were laid, and they were eventually freed, but it obviously sends a message, and again signals to us that, well, it's hard to say just how much Sihanouk is personally overseeing these systematic resorts to violence and the use of fear against political opponents, but he's certainly justifying them after they occur, and he's setting the tone. So let's just, again, reiterate what we are talking about here, and simply put it in this way. If you are openly oppositional to the Sihanouk regime, you can expect intimidation, violence, jail time, or even assassination. And remember, this is at a time when Cambodia is, you know, on the surface doing quite nicely. Philip Short ties this all together neatly in Pol Pot. Quote, To most Westerners, the early 1960s were a golden age for Cambodia. One American resident recalled, There was complete peace and internal security something which the country had not known within living memory. By 1960, one could travel anywhere without danger from outlaws or hindrance from the authorities. The same week that Q Sampan was imprisoned, Sihanouk presented the prizes for the most glamorous motor car and owner at a Concorde d'Elegance at Kep, won by Miss Cantal de Montero and her Ford Thunderbird, while a Dutch businessman's wife was runner-up. To the affluent, Cambodia was an oriental paradise ruled by an entrancing playboy prince. The other side of the coin was better not thought about. End quote. And that, I think that says a lot about Cambodia in the early 60s, but also where the Khmer Rouge were at this time as well. Their revolutionary movement. Well, it's a bit of a tough sell. On the one hand, you've got the slightest questioning of Sihanouk's power and government, resulting in anything between public humiliation and, you know, being shot in the street. Second to that, you've got this ideological problem, where Sihanouk himself is getting plenty of funding from the giants of communism on the world stage, China and the Soviet Union. 
as well as his relatively stronger relationship with North Vietnam rather than the South, particularly after the series of plots against him that the prince is chalking up to the influence of the CIA and the Diem regime. But even with that dabbling with the idea of conspiring with people like Dap Chuan and Son Yok Tan to install a different leader, that is more or less played off as, you know, just a little thing we were doing, don't worry about that, just a little bit of subterfuge and espionage. The US is still providing the vast majority of monetary aid to Sihanouk's Cambodia. He has got that base covered as well. It's like we said in the episode a couple back, Sihanouk is very good at having his cake and eating it too. Milton Osborne, whose book about Sihanouk we've quoted at length, and he was actually living in Cambodia at this time, also has a lovely way of summing up this period, and I'll quote from that biography. Barely suppressed political divisions, major inequalities of power and wealth, endemic corruption, all these were present throughout the years he was in power. But if the carefully cultivated image of an oasis of peace, or fairy tale kingdom, were never realities. There was a period around 1960 that for many, both Cambodian and foreigner alike, seemed suffused with a roseate hue. End quote. And he goes on to say, you know, Phnom Penh in particular could reasonably claim to be the nicest city in Southeast Asia at this time. It had come a long way since we first began describing it in episodes way earlier in the series. Its population had probably increased from around 100,000 prior to the Second World War, to about half a million in the early 60s. That being said, it was still not a population predominantly of Khmer themselves, still roughly split around one-third each between Cambodians, Chinese, and Vietnamese. And by the 60s, a host of other nationalities from around the world, and a small but visible remainder of French since the colonial years. And while the city had always been home to the elites of Cambodia, especially those Khmer from an elite background, the city in these years had become more livable for those that weren't strictly part of those more wealthy or educated tiers. As we've seen with people like Salot Sar and the rest of them, there is room for those that were just teaching or having a few jobs at one time, these so-called less privileged people. But there are also those that move from the countryside that find work in some kind of manual labour or as a cyclo driver. Those making up this group more often than not would find themselves living in some of the shanty towns that had begun to grow on the city's western outskirts. Far from the scenic and charming Phnom Penh, few foreigners would visit this area. Nor would many of the privileged Cambodian class. In fact, Osborne suggests that if, say, a journalist would have visited this area and reported upon it, tarnishing the vision of a contented island of peace... Well, it would be likely that said journalist would have been barred from re-entering the kingdom on any subsequent visit. Now, what about the areas way outside Phnom Penh? I mean, we've spoken about these rural areas before and their stark difference to a place like the capital. The much, let's say, slower life. Very agrarian. Well, Osborne says that Sinook had done well to make these Cambodians feel like they were part of his state too. He strikes me as having the energy of a politician just a few weeks out from election day, but always at that level. He is constantly out kissing babies and cutting ribbons and opening this or that or doing a speech for people in the cities, but also the peasants out in the countryside. There is a very sort of paternal as well as patronising feel to a lot of this, and Sihanouk himself will talk about the people in the kingdom as his children. But unlike any ruler before him, Sihanouk was ready to go out among his people. This readiness earned him a lot of affection that went beyond the traditional awe that they may have had for a monarch. Milton Osborne, again, sums up this relationship or this keeping up of a kind of status amongst the country quite eloquently, as well as alluding to its potential limits. Quote, but their warmth of welcome did not mean that the peasants' affection for Sihanouk was unconditional, nor that their passive support for his governance could necessarily be transformed into action to prop him up once his position was threatened. During the good times, as the years around 1960 can now be seen to have been, Sihanouk would point with pride to a devoted rural population as his fundamental base of support. When times were no longer good, Sihanouk found, to his dismay, 
that some of his children were all too ready to disobey their papa. Another important point that Osborne raises is that in addition to this adoration of Sihanouk, even if it had its potential limits, and though they felt part of his Cambodia in some kind of traditional sense, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone felt as if they were connected to the modern state of Cambodia, symbolised by Phnom Penh. He points to some undefined number of those rural Cambodians who, even as opposed to others in similar environments and circumstances, felt no connection to a world linked to Phnom Penh. He says, quote, There were those whose world was strictly circumscribed by their immediate surroundings, and who had no wish for it to be otherwise. A common feature of such groups was a deep distrust of cities, and of those who lived in them. To the extent that peasants came into contact with the wider world, it was almost always in circumstances that led them to feel despised and exploited. Officials from Phnom Penh, or linked to it, treated these fringe dwellers with disdain whenever they encountered them. This relationship between Sihanouk, and let's face it, the vast majority of Cambodians, is naturally something that will prove quite pivotal in this story. And it's a relationship that some in the new Kampuchean Workers' Party, potentially some of the old guard, those more associated with the Isarak or the Khmer Viet Minh, might have been slightly more respectful of. If we look back at that Congress in 1960, which occurs about a month or so after Q Sampan and other prominent known leftists were released from jail following that spate of intimidation and repression coming from the Sankum, we can perhaps even start to outline a changing of the vanguard from those old Khmer Viet Minh to the more French-educated Marxists. I know this can all be a little confusing, and I'm just trying to go over it a few times to set up the rest of the episode, but it is important to take into consideration this shift because it will contextualise some events during the Khmer Rouge regime itself, or at least one of the debates about the regime's inner machinations, where some historians suggest that there were prominent factions within the party and power struggles that resulted in massive internal purges, suspicion of certain zones colluding with Vietnam, as well as potential reasons for why the regime took a particular ideological angle over another. If you recall the events of episode 15, you might remember the quite sorry, meandering state that the Khmer communists found themselves in after Geneva. This was compounded by the defection of one of the leaders of the movement, Siu Heng, who had been in charge of the rural networks of those communists that wanted to stay committed to the cause following the cessation of the First Indochina War. Tu Samut, the veteran Khmer Viet Minh and Pol Pot's mentor in the Vietnamese jungle, had been in charge of the Phnom Penh network. After Siu Heng's defection, the city-based communists, of which most, if not all, of the Cambodian students who had become Marxists in Paris belonged to, suddenly became the de facto head of the movement. As we discussed at the end of that episode, Tu Samut was named party secretary, Nguyen Chea his deputy. Pol Pot was elected to the number three position. As Ben Kiernan writes in How Pol Pot Came to Power, quote, it is significant that students who had returned from France, through their influence on the Phnom Penh Party Committee, easily the largest urban committee in a party many of whose rural committees had ceased functioning, had emerged in positions 3, 4, and 5 in the hierarchy. He goes on. What distinguished most of the French-educated radicals from the veterans of the independent struggle was, as before, their conception of the Sihanouk regime. The Pol Pot group, tended to be implacably opposed to it as a backward, dictatorial monarchy. As younger militants, they wanted to strike back against repression, and being more middle-class in background, they were particularly infuriated by Sihanouk's feudal characteristics. His personalised autocracy, and the fawning praise of him that was required of everyone in public life. The veterans, on the other hand, were much more inclined to see Sihanouk's neutrality and his increasingly anti-imperialist stance as positive factors in an Indochina-wide struggle for socialism, while at the same time also giving the prince credit for maintaining the country's independence, a goal for which they themselves had sacrificed much in the past. It is also likely that, through their closer relationship with the rural masses, 
they appreciated the fact of Sihanouk's popularity and the fact that independence had meant something for the peasants, predominantly an end to rural insecurity and far less of a taxation burden on their rice harvest. End quote. Now, I want to perhaps go down a somewhat unsavoury route here and get us to try and imagine what it was like for these members of the newly designated Kampuchean Workers' Party. They've just seen many of the prominent leftists operating in Phnom Penh in the open arrested and arbitrarily jailed. They've seen the political face of the party continually demeaned by Sihanouk on a national level. One of the leaders of their movement, responsible for many networks of their comrades in the countryside, has defected and left them in shambles. They lack firepower and numbers, aside from the small but growing recruits that some of the French-educated returnees have began to find in some of the private schools in the city. And within the party, there are divisions in opinion about whether the country they live in is even independent or not. Their Vietnamese comrades are more or less happy with the status quo in Cambodia. They don't see Sihanouk as a hindrance to their fight against the South Vietnamese, the US-backed Siem regime. Well, I feel that one of the overwhelming feelings they may have had would be fear. Fear of being left out. Fear of being imprisoned or killed. Fear of being perennially subjected to Sihanouk's rule. Which a motivated, radical core was considering antithetical to their ideology. This core, eventually led by Pol Pot, would claim that their country was neither free nor independent that the US had simply replaced France after Geneva, that their economy was entirely dominated by imperialist influence, as was society and the lifestyle of the ruling class. They would claim that Sihanouk is a mere puppet, which, given all we've seen of him so far, is quite a stretch to claim. They would have to decide what their political line would be. This line by the way, adhering to the party line is something we will hear over and over again when the regime comes to power. But this, I don't know, I think about it like some business you might work for that have a, a motto or their core values, an encapsulation of their goals and methods. The Campuchian Workers' Party chose independence, national sovereignty, self-reliance and revolutionary violence as their political line. Moves were taken to re-establish the networks in the countryside. Some of the old guard were entrusted to do so, like Rus Nim, who went back to the western provinces, and Sao Pim, who went back to the eastern zone. Meng, another veteran of the First Indochina War, will head to the southwest, and it is the man under him, Ta Mok, who will become quite an influential figure as well. Again, I mentioned some of these names out of the 20 or so members who were at this train car meeting, knowing full well that they may go unremembered for some time and remain largely unfamiliar. But these two in particular, these old guard, will figure in the regime itself, before they are purged, that is, and Mok, who will go on to be called the Butcher, will be highly involved as he carves out power in the southwest. But Ying Seri, one of the Paris group, is also engaged in this activity, touring the countryside and trying to revive dormant cells. As Philip Short suggests, this move will pay dividends later, when the Khmer Rouge will really count on their networks in the rural areas to thrive, as well as when they can no longer safely operate in a city like Phnom Penh. Elizabeth Becker, in When the War Was Over, says that the party line that the Railway Congress decided upon was, quote, a mixture of Vietnamese and Chinese influence, as filtered through the Vietnamese. The latter course of revolutionary violence or terrorism against the establishment was the same as that adopted by the communists in South Vietnam to combat Diem's serious and effective police actions against them. Sihanouk's harassment of the Cambodian communists had been mild by comparison, but nearly as effective. Revolutionary violence was not implemented at the start. The Cambodians knew unarmed political struggle had been disastrous for them in the countryside, where they now wanted to recruit thousands of peasants. But they were so poorly equipped that it took them one year simply to find enough weapons to organise small secret defence units to guard the leaders. Those units were often armed with nothing other than knives and clubs. <laughs> 
She also points out another result of this Congress in 1960. Quote, Calling the Congress and proclaiming the establishment of an independent Marxist-Leninist party was dangerous and crucial for Cambodia's communists. Although the move had Hanoi's approval, it led to a deeper division within Cambodia's communist movement. Nearly 1,000 Cambodians remained in North Vietnam, undergoing communist training there, including Son Nhoc Minh, whom Hanoi continued to treat as the leader of the Cambodian communists. There were now two potentially competitive, hostile groups of Cambodian communists. Those in Hanoi, under direct Vietnamese supervision, and those in Cambodia, who just had proclaimed themselves an independent party. End quote. As Becker suggests there, and as we have been at pains to establish throughout the series so far, the consequences of these kinds of moves will be quite stark during the regime's time in power itself. Significant in particular for those Cambodians, mostly Khmer Rouge in fact, who were buried in a mass grave behind the school building I visited in Prevang, and the thousands buried in similar circumstances elsewhere, not to mention the vast majority of those who were sent to somewhere like S21. But in any case, this is sort of how 1960 ends. Sihanouk, very much in the peak of his powers, the communists surviving and setting out a plan for gaining recruits, while also signalling their intent to not just be completely subservient to the dictates of Hanoi. The Paris group is gaining more of a foothold in the party due to circumstances somewhat fortuitous for them, and Pol Pot is in third position. They have their foothold in some schools in the city, and they are beginning to spread their message to those who are willing to hear it. While many of those operating in the schools are openly progressive, they do not speak of their party affiliations, but rather set an example of moral people, socially conscious and not corrupt. Unlike many of the Cambodian elite, it should be said. As we move into 1961, Sihanouk lets the pressure off on the communists at home, as he becomes distracted by Cambodia's relationship with Thailand and South Vietnam. Our old friend Son Yok Tan is still causing a bit of trouble with his free Khmer movement, the Khmer Sarai a kind of loose paramilitary group recruited and paid for by the Thai and South Vietnamese, and working under the command of Tan, who had been exiled for a number of years at this point. The left-wing newspapers, like Q Sampans, were allowed to reopen, and Sihanouk said something to the effect of, gagging or imprisoning convinced militants has never served any purpose but to turn them into martyrs. Again, it's this kind of tightrope he walks both internationally and domestically, where one valve is released in order to put pressure on another, but as another election year comes around in 1962, Sihanouk doesn't forget to paint the left in fairly grim terms either. On a tour of the provinces, he delivers some speeches that, in Philip Short's words, were harsh and prophetic, warnings about the Khmer communists' ultimate aims, saying that a communist regime in Cambodia might achieve more than the Sankum had done, but at the price of depriving the individual of all that is dear to him, basic freedoms and the joys of family life, and turning him into a producing machine, which over time has all human values sucked out of it. A system that reduces men to the level of brute beasts. If that wasn't prescient enough, he also remarked, Laos is lost already. So is South Vietnam. Cambodia's turn will follow, going on to say that American policy was so inept and out of touch with Asian realities that the precarious power balance that enabled Cambodia to live at peace would inevitably collapse, and not to the West's advantage. But that is not to say that the prince was going to just give up. In the second half of 1961, with the election approaching the next year, his attention was once again fully turned to the last political party in the country that would potentially contest the vote. The official Communist Party, the Pratyachon. By now, this had become a fairly well-oiled machine. Sihanouk looks at those elections as a way of getting 100% of the vote, as if democracy was more or less just a way of him consolidating his popularity and power. He uses the same playbook that he did in the 1957 elections, that basically disintegrated the Democrats. In one instance, humiliating the spokesman of the party, Non Suon, at a special session of the National Congress. 
The prince refused to respond to questions that were put to him about corruption, rising prices and unemployment, and this ends in a kind of mass outrage by Sankum supporters toward the communist politician. But they were not allowed to physically assault him, as was the case with those Democrats that turned up to that public debate in 1957. But things don't exactly last like that for long. There's really no dressing this up too much. We can basically consider the Pratyachon existing as being annoying for Sihanouk. For someone that goes for 100% on the old voting machine, maybe this is something that many listeners might not realise is an option in our, you know, modern liberal democracies, but one move you might not have considered is just making other political parties go away. The Pratyachon is the last man standing, Remember, one of the whole things about the Sankum movement was that it would try and absorb politicians from either side of the spectrum into just one big national party. But those unwilling to do so are going to find themselves in the sights sooner or later. On January 10th, 1962, we have another plot on our hands. This one occurs in Kampong Cham. What is alleged to have occurred is that members of the Pratyachon in this area were going a little above and beyond their remit, that they weren't just doing politics stuff, trying to get involved in the election, but they were collecting intelligence about the Cambodian military and sharing it with the Vietnamese communists. The police uncovered documents, never published, mind you, that provided evidence that they were doing this. Philip Short goes as far as to say that this was an outright fabrication, but Kiernan says that it's possible that there was at least some amount of collusion going on, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising considering Hanoi had basically instructed the Cambodians to have this above-ground, below-ground communist movement. But I think it's instructive to look at the results of this plot being uncovered to suggest why Sihanouk's government reacted like they did. This wasn't going to be handled with some strong words. Rather, the 12 members of the Pratyachon that were accused were arrested and charged with treason as was Non Suan, the spokesman of the party at the National Assembly. Chu Chet, editor of the party's paper, was also arrested, as was the editor of another leftist paper. Sihanouk doesn't stop there, however, saying, I will not pardon these traitors, I'll have them shot, because that's what they were planning against me. Kio Mias, who was a prominent member of the Kampuchean Workers' Party, who had been tasked with running the public face of the communists, where well, he goes into hiding. This signalled the end of the Cambodian communists' attempt to have an official political party to contest the elections. As Short says, So ended the communists' first and last attempt to operate legally in Sihanouk's Cambodia. No Pratyachon candidate stood in the 1962 elections, and to all intents and purposes, the group ceased to exist. End quote. Now, those accused will eventually have their sentences reduced to a life sentence, but it's still this moment of like, well, okay, there is no point in doing this in the open anymore. That being said, you know, we just said how the Sankom works, like it will have prominent leftists in it, those that could be dragged over, communists even. But as long as they were nominally pledging allegiance to Sihanouk, it would all be okay. So when the elections do run in June of 62, Hu Yuan, one of the returned Paris students who was teaching in a high school and had been a minister since 1958, is re-elected to the parliament. And for the first time, Kiu Sampan became a minister as well. You might be asking yourself, wait, so the same guy that was beat up in the street by the police and Sihanouk totally being fine with that and shutting down the guy's paper... Sihanouk is happy for him to be in his government? You betcha. Not only that, but Sihanouk had endorsed him to run for that seat initially. And in October, he promotes Sampan to the Secretary of State for Commerce. And that, you know, that's a pretty sensitive economic post for one of the country's leading leftist intellectuals. And a suspected communist. As Elizabeth Becker says, quote, The drama of this mise-en-scene is pure Sihanouk. On the one hand, he was trying to co-opt one of his most errant subjects. On the other hand, he wished to use these talented economists to pull his country out of its long-standing problems, and perhaps to interpret Cambodia's needs to the communist countries offering aid. If they proved unacceptable, 
the prince could make them scapegoats for the problems they were told to solve. End quote. Again, we can imagine Sihanouk operating this complicated machine with knobs and dials, releasing pressure on one end of the political spectrum and increasing it on the other, cracking down on the left brutally and then offering an olive branch. The key, I guess, to all of that is that as long as Sihanouk was in charge and you were loyal to him, you would be okay. But that kind of maintenance of that system could only go on so long. As Chandler points out in The Tragedy of Cambodian History, quote, To be sure, the early 1960s brought many problems that remained unresolved and became significant later. They included the continuing eminence of Lon Nol as commander of Cambodia's army and minister of defence, financial extravagance on behalf of Cambodia's elite, and mismanagement and corruption at all levels of the bureaucracy. Sihanouk did little serious thinking about long-range economic planning, particularly about improving agricultural yields, reducing rural indebtedness, or making use of an increasingly educated workforce. Another problem, shrugged off by many at the time, was the monopoly on information and public opinion held by Sihanouk. End quote. There were cracks beginning to form in modern Cambodia, and Sihanouk, through a mixture of repression, ignorance, self-aggrandizement, information manipulation, and a healthy amount of charm, was papering them over. But who was left to challenge him? He was surrounded by sycophants and those amassing their own wealth simply through their proximity to him. And those that were secretly looking to take power, the Kampuchean Workers' Party, they would soon suffer another blow as well. On the 20th of July, 1962, Tu Samut, leader of the newly named Kampuchean Workers' Party, was on his way to a marketplace in the southern part of Phnom Penh. He had been living the kind of double life that many of the Cambodian communists had, making a living as a labourer in public and running the party's urban party network infrastructure in secret. Originally a monk, the veteran of the Khmer Viet Minh had been one of the first Khmer communists to become part of the original Indo-Chinese Communist Party. Quite a life to lead, fighting from the jungles, infiltrating the cities once again, trying to maintain this subversive movement like a struck match that's flame is barely visible and so easily extinguished by the lightest of disturbances. On this warm, rainy day, the leader of the KWP was actually heading to the market in order to buy some medicine for his sick child. What happened next is, well, the details are a little fuzzy, but I'll explain why in just a moment. What we do know is that Lon Knoll's security police were waiting for him. They allegedly took him to a house which belonged to Lon Knoll, where he was tortured. Apparently, he refused to cooperate or talk, and soon after he was unceremoniously killed and buried on a piece of wasteland in the Stung Mianche district of the city. Now, just quite what happened here, and who was responsible, is a point of slight contention. For instance, the Khmer Rouge tribunals, in their kind of roundup of the history of the party, said that the party secretary's disappearance was, quote, never elucidated. Philip Short, in his biography of Pol Pot, he says that it was never convincingly established who betrayed Samut. But if we look to the two most famous historians of the regime, David Chandler and Ben Kiernan, they can come down kind of hard on what they think happened, and there is a little academic jousting between the two of them over the course of a couple of books and reviews. Kiernan says in How Pol Pot Came to Power, first published in 1985, that the most likely explanation for Tu Samut's disappearance was that it was due to intra-party conflict and that the Pol Pot faction within was responsible. Chandler, first in 1991 with Tragedy of Cambodian History, writes that it was probably simply Lon Nol's security police, perhaps acting in the course of a raid, and that they may not have actually known that they had captured the head of the KWP before killing him. In... 91, Chandler is fairly open to events being unclear. He says it may have been Pol Pot who betrayed his mentor and superior. But eight years later, in Chandler's biography of Pol Pot, he is slightly more dismissive of that position. He says, quote, 
Since 1979, the Vietnamese have maintained that he, somewhat, was murdered with connivance of Pol Pot, a view supported by Ben Kiernan, who has called Pol Pot's involvement the most likely explanation. Given Salot Sa's relatively low status at the time, and Samut's popularity, and the possibility of leaks, Kiernan's argument depends on reading Pol Pot's power and villainy back into 1960. Presumably, Sa would have wanted Samut killed because Samut was pro-Vietnamese, and his removal would clear the way for Sa to rise inside the party. In fact, as we shall see, Salot Sa himself was assiduously pro-Vietnamese in all his activities before 1967, and retained Vietnamese confidence until the 1970s. End quote. Kiernan, in the footnotes for his claims, says that evidence for Pol Pot's involvement can be gleaned from confessions of a Khmer Rouge cadre in 1977. And perhaps it isn't clear, I'm not sure how much of this has come up earlier, but when we say confessions in this instance, particularly when we are kind of filling in gaps in the story via these stories that are told by those within the party themselves, any time the word confessions are used as that source, it means that they are generally being extracted at S21. What that also means is that they are being extracted under extreme duress, torture. And we will see many of the people who have been involved in the story so far have their particular threads tied up through these means. But in any case, Kiernan points to this particular confession of a cadre who was working with the KWP in 1962 as having been the person who killed Tu Samut. So that points inward. He says that it may have been Pol Pot ordering this be done in order to cover his own tracks, ordering that that cadre is arrested and made to confess, he means. Kiernan also points to a Lon Nol statement in 1970 that still mentioned Tu Samut as if he was alive, which he sees as the Republican government being unaware of the disappearance and therefore innocent of involvement. Chandler says that just because Pol Pot never explicitly denied assassinating Tu Samut is not persuasive evidence that they did it. And in his footnotes for Tragedy of Cambodian History, he says that Lon Nol would have these regular witch hunts against the left, which included summary execution of suspects at the moment of arrest. He says that this is probably what happened, but points to another party as the possible source of betrayal, and explains this through the use of confessions of two cadre from 1977 and 1978. These guys had been bodyguards within the early movement, had in fact been bodyguards for Siu Heng, the former head of the rural networks who had defected to Sihanouk in 1958. They say that he had been the one to tip off Lon Nol's police, and that a US embassy officer had asked Siu Heng what happened, whether Sihanouk had had Tu Samut liquidated, and he replied that Lon Nol knows what happened to him. There are a few things apart from this academic whodunit, a few larger themes and historical questions that this is actually bringing up. Kiernan is making the point that Pol Pot and a faction of those who were ideologically similar to him were ruthless killers, well before the regime took power. As Chandler says, this is also alluding to the anti-Vietnamese sentiment that Kiernan says was a cornerstone of the Khmer Rouge regime. Kiernan really brought this out to a large degree in a book like The Pol Pot Regime, where he says that racism was the predominant reason for many of the worst mass killings the regime perpetrated. Chandler, and others, have been less suggestive of that being the main reason, and it is one of the larger historical debates about the nature of democratic Kampuchea. Were they predominantly racist, power-hungry totalitarians, or were they simply another example of an attempted socialist utopia that resorted to killing as their first method of eradicating potential counter-revolutionaries. It is a question that I've spent much time pondering, and I'll try and be very even-handed in the way I describe these things in later episodes, and let you decide which you think is more persuasive. So, apart from being a kind of interesting academic quarrel there, as you can see, there are things on either side that people can point to, 
and I guess it makes sense to follow Short's lead and just say, look, we, we don't actually know how or why, but we know he was killed, and we know what happened next. And what is the aftermath of this? Well, again, imagine that happening from the perspective of the Khmer communists. One half of your leadership defected a few years ago, you get rebuilding, and then the next leader just disappears one night. What must have made it even weirder is that because Tusamot didn't give up any information, no further arrests were made. A certain amount of trepidation spread. Nuon Chea said years later that he was terrified. And in the wake of Samut's disappearance, it was Pol Pot who became acting secretary of the party's central committee. But why was it Pol rather than Nuon Chea? After all, the leadership at the train car congress had been Samut, Chea, then Pol, right? Well, another quirk of history, I guess, but it is briefly explained in Short's biography. There, he says that Nuon Chea had come under just the slightest amount of scrutiny from his fellow comrades due to his proximity to the traitorous Su Heng that we mentioned earlier. Chea was married to his niece. So there was that. There was also the matter of a large sum of money he had received from the Vietnamese communists in order to buy a house to you know, function as this facade for his secret life. Short says that there had been some mutterings about his loyalty. And during the year that Samut disappeared, Chea had become a little withdrawn from party work. Therefore, despite being ahead of Pol in the rankings, he didn't pick up the acting secretary duties. Instead, it is our handsome, charming boy from Prex Bao, Sarot Sa, well on his way to becoming brother number one. He had eagerly accepted the responsibility, and as Elizabeth Becker says, quote, he exhibited a cool, refined confidence in the midst of increasing turbulence, and he was a talented administrator of all the details of a subversive movement. He was especially adept at maintaining secrecy and was capable of enhancing routine assignments with an aura of mystery and prestige. End quote. It is at this time that we can imagine Pol Pot still teaching at the Progressive School in Phnom Penh, conducting these semi clandestine seminars on civic virtue, justice, and corruption that we introduced the episode with. As I sit here writing this, I spent a while just kind of staring at the wall and pondering it all, asking when he became this person, this ambitious, considered, and capable revolutionary. Obviously, it didn't happen overnight, but you think about the, well, not, not lackadaisical, that would be a bit much, but you compare him to someone like your Ing Siris or your Kyu Sampans, Kiyomias. Paul went to Paris as someone that wasn't that particularly interested in politics and came back to join the Viet Minh in the jungles. And now, ten years later, he is leading the Cambodian communists. And in just a little over ten years more, he would lead them to a total victory over their countrymen, and a terrible fate for Cambodia. I think that might be why Kiernan felt like there was an opportunity to paint Pol Pot as a villainous, racist maniac as early as 1962, and blame him for Samut's disappearance. It's tempting to try and include some kind of... I mean, you'll often see this in serial killer stories, right? The person that disappeared in the killer's neighbourhood, but when the killer was not officially active yet. It's a way for us to just make them bad in our heads from as early point as possible. It's like I've said in a couple of episodes so far, it, it does become hard to know when... When does Salot Sar become Pol Pot? When does he change from idealist, preaching about social injustice, to someone capable of ordering the deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent people? Is he that in 1962? Would he be pushed further toward that? It is, like many facets of his personality, quite impossible to know. As 1962 drew to a close, and indeed into the new year, events that had no discernible connection to the Cambodian communists, but seem like they might have been responsible, will have further effects on the leadership structure. And more. 
In what began as a fairly ordinary student rally that was protesting their right to ride bikes on the footpath in Siem Reap, well, this would soon turn to a full riot once news broke that one student had actually died in police custody. Masses of students, now enraged, ended up beating to death two police officers and basically taking control of the town for about three days. They ransacked police headquarters, but they also committed the faux pas of chanting anti sihanouk and anti sankum messages, tearing down paintings of the prince. Sihanouk himself was in Beijing at the time, and he was not too pleased with what was going on back in his country, particularly when this kind of student protest spread to a couple of other cities around the country, Phnom Penh and Kampong Cham in particular. This was, well, was pretty unprecedented. It was unlikely that this was a coordinated action stemming from Son Yok Tan's Khmer Sarai, although Lon Nol feeds information to Sihanouk upon his return that it could be traced to them. US intelligence, meanwhile, seeking to point the finger at who they would like to blame, say that these schools with communist leanings must be the cause. While Sihanouk himself, in fairly classic fashion, comes back and says, you know who I bet it was? That bloody Kang Van Sak, now retired from politics and teaching education in Phnom Penh, one of my old enemies. Eventually, the army are sent in to quash the riots. But it was during this time, perhaps initially as a reaction to Sihanouk being in Beijing, perhaps in reaction to the protests, that the high-ranking members of the Khmer Workers' Party meet again for another congress, this time held in an apartment near the central market of Phnom Penh. This hastily convened secret meeting was more or less called just to elect a new party secretary in the wake of Tu Samut's disappearance. Pol Pot had been taking up these duties for roughly six months or so, and it's no surprise that he was officially designated the top position at this meeting. The way this was described in their jargon was to elect Pol Pot as party secretary of a new four-man standing committee. Now what that means is that these four are designated as the highest decision-making body in the party. They are a committee, meaning that they will regularly convene to discuss matters and will in the end choose what to do. Being secretary, as Pol Pot is named at this time, conveys that he has a bigger say in these discussions within the committee. Democratic centralism, as Lenin would have put it. Now, at this Congress, they decide to put Pol Pot top, then Nguyen Chea as his deputy, then also elected to that top four, Yang Sari and Sao Pim. A wider decision-making body, meaning, you know, a central committee that isn't the standing committee, also has some new members appointed, including Ta Mok, whom we mentioned earlier, Ross Nim, Vaughan Vett, and Son San. Again, some of these names will become increasingly familiar as we go, so don't worry too much at the moment, my dear listener. It's worth mentioning at this point as well that some of the Pratya Chon members kind of fall out of top positions here, so Kyo Mias and Non Suwon drop out altogether, and instead we begin seeing this definite shift toward former students taking positions of power, moving into number 1, 3, 5, 6, and 11. Veterans of the Khmer Viet Minh were marginalised, and only Sao Pim still retained a degree of geographical autonomy as the standing committee took up responsibility for activities nationally, rather than someone in one area or another making decisions. Except, as I said, Sao Pim, who maintains the eastern zone on the border with Vietnam. Keep an eye out on that one. A few of the books I've got here still point out that Nguyen Chea would have wanted the top spot at this meeting, but through either a mixture of Pol Pot spreading some of those rumours about him, or his links to Siu Heng, or things along those lines, they might have stymied his chance at being the secretary. Or it could be that by this point, Nguyen Chea, himself a very astute political manoeuvrer, could see that there was a growing faction, particularly as the power of Cambodian communists became increasingly in the hands of those that were in Phnom Penh, that there was a... Well, many of the returned students from Paris were upwardly mobile in the organisation, forming a kind of clique, whereas some of the old guard were not. 
Chea may have seen it prudent to throw his lot in with someone like Pol Pot, rather than try and face him, signalling a kind of fealty in exchange of remaining in the standing committee, just not becoming leader. I think I've mentioned it on the show before, but it's maybe Henry Lockard who will go on to describe Pol Pot and Nguyen Chea as two sides of the one brain during the regime's time in power, so it's not as if Nguyen Chea loses out too much in the long run. Another one who might be making similar strides is Ta Mok, who by this time had become quite close with Pol Pot in Phnom Penh. Again, keep an eye on him as we go. This Congress does not really make any policy changes or new additions to that party line. As I said, it's convened more or less just to sort out the leadership. A leadership who must have been quite concerned when, literally just days later, in response to some of the turmoil that had erupted, over the few weeks in which he had been absent, Sihanouk comes back to Cambodia and publishes a list of 34 known subversives who were planning on bringing down the government. It is a list described by David Chandler as a hodgepodge of journalists, activists, and non-communist liberals like Kang Van Sack. But it also contains the names of a few notable teachers at some of Phnom Penh's progressive high schools. One of the names was Salot Saar. Next time on In the Shadows of Utopia, 1963, the year it all changed. At his news conference, President Kennedy draws a question regarding the virtual press blackout on military operations in South Vietnam. He has asked how deeply the United States is involved in what seems to be a growing war against communist guerrillas. The, uh, there is a war going on in uh, South Vietnam. I think uh, last week there were over 500 uh, killings, assassinations, uh, bombings. Uh, the casualties are high. It's a, uh, I said last week, a subterranean war, guerrilla war of increasing uh, ferocity. The United States, since the end of the uh, Geneva Accord, setting up the South Vietnamese government as an independent government has been assisting Vietnam economically to maintain its independence and viability and also has sent training groups out there which have been expanded in recent weeks as the attacks on the government and on the people of South Vietnam have increased. We are out there on training and on uh, transportation and uh, we are uh, assisting in every way we properly can the people of South Vietnam who with the greatest courage and with the under under danger, are attempting to maintain their freedom. Now, this is a area where uh, there is a a good deal of danger. And uh, it's a matter of information. We don't want to have information which is of assistance to the enemy. And it's a matter which I think will have to be worked out with the government of Vietnam, which bears the primary responsibility. 